I said earlier I've, I've uh, got to work with someone who's been in OWASP for a long time. I'm gonna add a really for Jeff Williams because he's been in OWASP for a really long time. So I'm happy to uh, uh, announce Jeff Williams and is jump-starting your DevSecOps pipeline with IAST and RASP. Awesome. Let's give it up for Jeff. All right, hey, thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, you may not know me, but you may have used some of my work. Uh, I wrote the OWASP Top 10, I wrote WebGoat, I wrote a SAPI, I led OWASP for eight years when we were first just starting out, and uh, it's actually some of the, the work that I, I value the most in my career. It's really rewarding to contribute, so this is an a, a initial plea. Join a project, contribute what you know. Uh, there's a tiny number of AppSec people in the world, and. 16 to 20 million developers worldwide. We've got a massive problem. So you know, join up, do something. It's it's uh, super rewarding. Um, so I'm going to start out with a couple of facts. Uh, it's a little bit of downer. Uh, the average application out there is super vulnerable. Uh, this is sort of a representation of most applications. You got libraries down here on the bottom, and custom code up here on the top. Now. One thing that's kind of interesting is that 71% of library code is never invoked. Like it's just along for the ride. It gets compiled into applications, but it never runs. So uh, that's actually pretty important when you're considering where you're going to spend your security time. Uh, I want you to think about just the code that runs. Code that doesn't run really isn't a problem. So if you look at that, then <coughs> three quarters of what you're looking at is custom code, and one quarter is library code. And you know, there are folks out there that are saying over and over again, you know, 90% of your application is libraries, so that's where you gotta spend all your effort. That is misleading. <laughs> so focus on where the vulnerabilities actually are. You're likely to have one, maybe two vulnerabilities in your library code for a typical application, and on average, 26.7 vulnerabilities in your custom code. So focus your efforts a little bit. By the way, this number is terrifying. <laughs> If this was one or two serious vulnerabilities per app, that would be a crisis in my mind because these apps are critical and we are not doing very well. If this was like the airline industry, for instance, and every plane you looked at had 26.7 safety vulnerabilities in it, you probably wouldn't fly a lot. But you guys are doing your banking and doing your online activities in applications that are super vulnerable. Okay. Uh, so that would be bad. Uh, there's also a lot of attack activity. So this is data collected across tens of thousands of applications um, over the last month. And every application that we protect was attacked. The attacks are rampant out there. More than half are attacked with SQL injection. And these numbers go up and down a little bit every month. But uh, there is a ton of attack traffic going on out there. So that's not a great combination. A lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of attacks going on uh, is a recipe for uh, disaster. Okay, so it's a little bit of the, the situation. I am trying to change that. <laughs> we have to do better. And DevSecOps is a possible path forward. Uh, DevOps has had really promising results for development in terms of improving not only the pace of delivery, but also the quality of delivery. And this is like the big thing that companies struggle to get over, is it seems like moving faster would make you less quality, but it's not true. Organizations that invest in DevOps, by and large, have massive improvements in quality uh, and resilience and, uh, and so on. So this is, I mean, this is a, a key experiment that we can try. We can try applying the principles of DevOps to security. And that's a, a look, that's not a, an obvious thing to do. There are a lot of companies out there that are telling you what DevSecOps is. Most of them are just saying to apply a little DevOps lipstick to the traditional ways that we do security. So I'll tell you, like, plugging Fortify or Veracode into Jenkins and running it as part of every build is not DevSecOps. Uh, that's a trivial step. That's automating the scan button. This is a much more fundamental translation. And uh, I think the path is to look at what Gene Kim laid out for us in the Phoenix Project, which you should obviously read if you haven't read it. But he lays out three ways of DevOps. 
And we need to translate those for security into three ways of security and see if this will work. I still think we're in early days for this, but I fully believe that this is the right path forward to massive improvements in security. But this is a different talk. Uh, we're going to talk about automation today. If you're interested in that topic, uh, I just published this uh, ref card on DevSecOps for DZone. And uh, I strongly encourage you to look at it. It's, got, uh, it's, it's pretty lengthy, and it's got a good explanation of how that process should work. Um, as a side comment, I wish I could have published this at OWASP, but uh, OWASP makes it really difficult for uh, vendors to participate. And that's a challenge for OWASP that I'd, I'd like to see addressed. Um, OK, so today we're going to focus on something much narrower. We're just going to talk about the automation piece of DevSecOps. We're going to build a DevSecOps pipeline. And we're going to use two technologies called IAST and RASP. Anybody, who's here has heard of either IAST or RASP? OK, so that's fantastic, because that's a big change from a couple of years ago. So I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of how we got here. There's two parts of AppSec. There's the development side, where we want to make our code better, with the code quality side, where we want to find vulnerabilities and eliminate them. And then there's the operations side. This is where we need to identify and block attacks. Now, historically, those have been two completely separate processes practiced largely by different people. That's really weird. Uh, the technologies on the, the development side, forever we had just SAST and DAST tools, static analysis and dynamic scanners. And those tools were everything. Uh, you know, they're all always really frustrating. They're slow and inaccurate, but that's what we had for a long time. Uh, a few years ago, IAST came out. That stands for Interactive Application Security Testing. And the big difference is that it takes some of the techniques of SAST and DAST and some other things and delivers them from inside the running application using a technique called instrumentation. We'll talk a little bit about how that works in a second. But getting inside the app is the key here. When you're inside the app, you have more context. So you can find a broader range of things, and you can be much more accurate. So that's the big advance here. And interestingly, almost the same thing happened on the operational side. So for years, we had WAFs and IDS. That was sort of it. That's how you protected apps. These look at HTTP traffic and try to block attacks, but they don't know what they're defending. And so they make a lot of mistakes. So you've probably seen a lot of WAF bypasses and, and things like that. RASP protects applications from inside the app. And so RASP sees the data the way the app sees the data, not what it looks like on the wire. And so it can do a lot better job here. So interestingly, that development happened you know, roughly the same time frame. And I think the trend is to provide those two things together. So a single agent that provides IAST and RASP and software composition analysis, which is sort of a third branch of this that's uh, come onto the scene. Uh, to analyze open source libraries. OK, so that's a little of the, the historical background of how we got here. I want to talk a little bit about how IAST and RASP really work. So I want you to imagine your application uh, or API, big code base across the whole stack. And with IAST and RASP, what you do is you add a component to the application. I mean, technically, it's an agent, but it's not like an operating system agent. This is like a library that you add to your app. And what that library does is it instruments your application. So it puts sensors all over your application. This is a little bit like plugging into that diagnostic port in your car so you can get you know, read out directly from the engine and temperature and speed and RPMs and so on. It's a little like that for your software. So we're going to read this data directly from the running app. We're going to watch it run. And using that information, we're going to identify vulnerabilities and attacks. So with IAST, uh, imagine a developer just using this application normally. Right? He's developing it. He's running it in a local environment or in a QA environment. When he runs this and the instrumentation is in place because he's got the agent, so imagine a SQL injection kind of vulnerability that he's just introduced. He types in, let's say, the word Jeff into his application. That data flows through the application. In fact, all the data paths flow through the application. We'll focus on this one that flows through and ends up eventually in a SQL query. 
Now, the, I asked, can see, it sees this path, and it can look back across this path and say, hey, was that data escaped or parameterized in some way that would have prevented SQL injection? If not, then we know, we've confirmed this is a vulnerable path through the application. We know it's exploitable, and we can report it. So this is, you know, again, why IAST and RASP are more accurate than SAST and WAFs and things like that. It's because they can only report things that actually happen in the application. They don't build a model of the application. They're using the actual application as what they're studying. And similarly, on the RASP side, it works almost the same way. This time, imagine an attack. And you know, the attacker enters or one equals one or something. Well, that data flows through the application. You know, it gets appended to strings and uh, split up into pieces and so on. And eventually, it ends up in a SQL query. The RASP can analyze that SQL query and say, hey, that data modified the meaning of that SQL query. That's the definition of SQL injection. And so we can say we've, we've literally observed a SQL injection attack inside the application. We've confirmed it. And we can intervene and prevent that query from going to the database. So the difference here between RASP and a WAF is you know, the, RAF, the WAF has to sit in front of the app, and it can only see the HTTP. RASP can see everything that's going on here. And you know, it, it knows the exact line of code. It knows the full query that's going to the database. It knows everything about this attack. So it can do a better job of blocking it. Everybody with me so far? Okay, good. All right, so today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use IAST and RASP to transform a relatively simple DevOps pipeline into a DevSecOps pipeline, okay? So we're gonna do this in three steps. We've got development, uh, CICD, and production. We're going, to do, we're going to spend some time in each of these areas. So we're going to use IAST and RASP here in development to automatically identify vulnerabilities and feed them, you know, get access to them in the tools that we're already using in dev. Very tight feedback. Then we're going to do, uh, well, we're going to do something with libraries. Then we're going to do uh, sort of the same thing in QA and test environment. We're going to add IAST RASP agent here, and we're going to run our test suite, and we're going to get feedback directly into our bug tracking tools and our, our build process. And then finally, in production, we're going to add IAST and RASP. And here, we're going to get great telemetry around who's attacking us, what they're doing, uh, and what apps they're attacking, uh, and feed that into our, uh, our sim. So most people talk about DevSecOps. They really are only talking about DevSec. They actually don't think about ops. And SecOps is a really important part of this puzzle. So I, I, I want you to remember this piece. It's an important part of DevSecOps landscape. OK. Let's get started. So yeah, these are the four steps we're going to go through. We're going to start in development, and then we'll work our way forward. So the goals for development, here's what I'd love to accomplish. right? I want to see security, speed, and scale. OK, security means that we've got the right the right rules, the right policies. We're checking a broad range of stuff. So this is interesting. Static tools don't check a lot of things. They don't check click checking. They don't check uh, things like parameter pollution. They don't check the things that are obvious in HTML because they don't have access to the HTML. Dynamic tools don't check things that are buried deep in the code, things like uh, hard-coded passwords and wrong encryption algorithms because they can't see that. Uh, and frankly, you know, neither of those approaches is really good at identifying things like injection problems, the number one thing in OS Top 10. But SQL injection, cross-site scripting, XXE, all those, command injection, all those, the dynamic and static tools are not great at that because data flow analysis is really hard. Speed is really important. We want to give developers instant feedback. That's when we can solve these problems for the most, you know, the most cost effectively. Give them instant feedback through the tools they're already using. Uh, and then scale is critically important. And so many people miss this. If you're securing one application, uh, you know, any process will look great. But if you zoom out and you say, hey, I've got 50 apps or 100 apps or 10,000 apps, all of a sudden you have to be really careful about any step in that process that requires experts. If there's an expert involved, it won't scale because there are not enough experts. <laughs> so every organization, every big organization that I've worked with runs into this problem. They can't scale their program. They get stuck at 50 apps or 70 apps or something because they just don't have enough experts to drive people through. 
In a lot of cases, what they do is they lower the bar, so they start turning off rules, and pretty soon you've got a very expensive, noisy XSS detector, and that's not helping anybody. So, uh, and it has to work, and scale also means it has to work across all your different kinds of apps. APIs are a critical part of the landscape now. Who here is developing an application that uses APIs? Holy shit, that's like 80% <laughs> at least. Uh, static and dynamic tools don't work on APIs. Sorry, they just don't. I've run massive experiments with lots of test cases. Dynamic tools can't scan them. Static tools can't handle the frameworks. They just don't work. So we need a different approach. So that's, those are my goals, right? So let's dig in. Um, today we're going to use uh, IAST and RASP agent from Contrast. That's my company. This is our community edition. It's free for everyone. So you can go and sign up and get started with this. But it's, uh, you're free to use whatever IAST and RASP technology you want. Uh, this is a generic talk. Uh, to use this, you sign up and then you get an account. You log in. You download the agent. Uh, we'll be doing Java examples, so you'll download the jar file. It's uh, just a standard Java stuff. Drop it in on your application server, and then that's it. Uh, you're off to the races. So that's the, the getting started part. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate this rather than go through slides. So I've got three environments that we're going to use, so pay attention to the top of the screen here. This one's my development environment. I've got a CI CD environment that we'll talk about in a few minutes, and a production environment that we'll get to in a second as well. So in development, I want you to imagine uh, I'm writing some code. This is an application called Pet Clinic. Uh, it's a Spring application that uses Hibernate and Spring Boot. So it's, uh, it's decently complicated. And uh, I've just uh, added it to uh, you know, my Eclipse environment, and I've got it running here. So I added the contrast jar file. This is my IAST and RASP agent. I just dropped it into my project here. And then in my palm, to enable it, uh, oh boy, I don't have my cursor. That's really a pain. There it is. OK, so in, uh, in my palm, I've enabled it uh, in two places. Here, I've enabled it in the Spring Boot plugin. So this will launch it every time the application runs as you're doing your normal testing. And then I've enabled it in the Surefire plugin. Uh, you can see right here. And this will run it every time we run our automated test cases. OK? So with that, I've, I've already started the application, but it just starts up normally with contrast in place. And uh, I'll just start doing a little bit of testing. So this is the pet clinic application. And now as I browse around and type in stuff, contrast is in the background doing security testing. And you can see already that there's new vulnerabilities uh, piling in. Uh, so this is, you know, this is how you use IAST, is it's just in the background finding vulnerabilities as you do your normal QA activities. Anyone can do this. Um, just a side note, uh, uh, someone yesterday stopped by the booth uh, as a developer. They said they had an app. And so I said, well, why don't we just try it? Uh, and so he sat down, he signed up, grabbed the IAST agent, added it to his app, and two minutes later, he was using contrast, finding vulnerabilities, and uh, analyzing his libraries and stuff. So this really can be quite quick. So I'll, I'll go into some of these alerts in just a second. But you can see, you know, using IAST is really easy. Now, in this case, there's an IDE plugin. And I'll just uh, refresh this here. These are the vulnerabilities that we just discovered in, uh, in contrast. So here you can see there's a hibernate injection, path traversal, stored XSS. Uh, you know, some of these are actually pretty hard for tools, traditional tools to find. I'll dig into the, uh, the hibernate injection here. And you can see there's an overview of, of what happened. And I'm going to try and uh, zoom in on this. We'll see if this works. So this tells a nice little story about this vulnerability. It says, hey, here's some details from an HTTP request. This is part of the get. That, that data, that ASDF, was accessed on this following line of code. So it gives you the method and the line number. And then it shows you where that data landed in this SQL query. So you can see that same ASDF that I just typed in right here. Uh, that's the, kind of the definition of SQL injection. The data flowed from untrusted source through into a SQL query without being parameterized or escaped. Uh, that's really powerful story that, you, that developers can get their head around to go fix this. Now, this, uh, 
you know, this vulnerability has some details about what you need to do to fix it uh, in terms of you know, making this a safe HQL query. Uh, by the way, this is Hibernate injection. It's a little bit different than SQL injection. Uh, because this application uses Hibernate, this, the query is a little more complicated, but uh, IaaS can handle that no problem. And there's also a lot of details here about this vulnerability. So you can see there's uh, you know, the line of code where the, the parameter came in, the details of building this query, uh, and then the, the line of code where this was actually sent to the database. So you can really see the whole flow and the full stack trace for, uh, for each of these steps. And the, idea, the whole idea here is to make this fixable for developers. So I can double click on this and go directly to the exact line of code where that vulnerability exists in the software. So the idea here, again, is let's make this easy for developers. Let's give it to them in the tools that they're already using. So I showed you before that, uh, that Slack message I got. We got these same vulnerabilities right through my Slack channel. And uh, here's a, a stored cross-site scripting event. You can see some data you know, went into a data place in, database in one place, and then somewhere else, some other thread pulled out that data. I asked can track that through the application. Uh, so uh, Slack is an interesting way of getting vulnerabilities to people in development because they get that instant feedback that, hey, something went wrong. And I wanted to show you one last way that I think is kind of interesting. Uh, this is a Chrome plugin. And so I'm, I'm going against the same application here. Uh, I'll go to the page that had that HQL vulnerability on it. And here you can see this little uh, I asked RASP plugin here. I can get the, the data about the vulnerabilities that are actually on this page. So for a developer, as they're just browsing, like using their, their app in development, they can get feedback on, hey, this page has these vulnerabilities in it. So it's a nice way of just kind of raising awareness. And the next step for us, by the way, is highlight the field so that you can see, hey, this field that you're typing data into right now is vulnerable to uh, some kind of attack. So again, this is, I think this is some of the kind of research that OWASP ought to be doing is make this data more useful. Um, okay, so uh, that's uh, a crash course in IAST in development. We're going to move to uh, uh, the CICD environment, or actually to libraries in just a second. I have a few slides here that in case this demo didn't work, uh, these are backup slides. So here's what we did. We put IAST into the project. We, uh, we found some vulnerabilities. And we delivered it through a bunch of different sources. Oh, I forgot to show um, this retire.js plugin, I think, is, is great. This is a, uh, a, a non contrast tool. But this is, uh, oops. This is a great way to, uh, to find libraries in, in JavaScript and anything that's out of date with known vulnerabilities. So it's a Chrome plugin that relies on retire.js. This will tell you about any libraries, JavaScript libraries that are out of date or need, uh, you know, have known vulnerabilities on any page that you visit. And it's terrifying when you're on your online banking site and they've got you know, five or six libraries that need updating. Uh, that's concerning. So I strongly recommend, recommend this tool. And so that was just a few of the integrations. Uh, I asked and RASP are, are integrated into a whole bunch of different tools. We don't have time to look at all of them, but uh, they're easy to integrate into a bunch of stuff. OK, so uh, let's move to uh, open source libraries. We showed, by the way, I think we showed that uh, IS and RASP do that security thing. The rule set's very broad, and it's super fast, so you get that instant feedback, and it scales really nicely. We just did one app, but it works the same and distributed across all your apps. So the next thing is uh, locking down some open source libraries. Um, let's, uh, oh, sorry, let's, uh, Look at this real quick. So my goals here are to get open source under control in organizations. We need, to, we need to know what we have. So in my vision, everyone should know exactly what open source they're running on every server, everywhere in their organization, always up to date. I like tools like uh, dependency check, but you have to run a scan. And so it's it, you'd have to build some infrastructure to keep everything up to date. I asked, does this, we'll show you. It, it collects all the information continuously. Uh, you need to assess those libraries, not for uh, just known vulnerabilities. Known vulnerabilities is the easiest problem in AppSec. It's literally, are you using this library? Then yes, you have this vulnerability. But also unknown vulnerabilities in these libraries as well, because there's lots of them. 
there's probably a handful of security researchers out there looking at open source libraries. That's crazy. Uh, anyway, we can talk about that another time. And then the last thing is detection really isn't enough. It's not enough to just have the fire alarm. We need the fire extinguishers. And so RASP here will protect those libraries from being exploited even if they're vulnerable. So we'll, we'll take a look at all that. So uh, let me... Uh, let me go to uh, the demo here, and I'll just pull up uh, what, uh, what uh, this IaaS tool has found about libraries in this environment. So we just started this. You know, when we started uh, the IaaS tool, it registered with this, uh, you know, this console, and it started reporting data. And here we see you know, sort of the dashboard for this. We see we found a few vulnerabilities in, in development. Uh, and I'll click on the Libraries tab here, and you can see that uh, IAS has analyzed all the libraries in the project, reports them here, tells you what version you're using, what the latest version is, and how much of that library is actually used. And actually, that's really important. If you want to save 72% of your work, then don't look at the libraries that are never invoked, because they don't matter. These are the ones that matter, the ones that are actually being used. And we've got details about the, any known vulnerabilities in any of these libraries. So this one has five CVEs against it. And you can pull it up and see uh, exactly what vulnerabilities are there. You can see, for any library, you can see exactly what applications are using it and exactly what servers it's running on. So I want you to imagine tomorrow some researcher finds a new vulnerability in Apache Commons exec. Well, you can just type that in here and pull up and see exactly where that library is everywhere in your enterprise. That's what we need, is we don't need to be scanning everything. We need to, be, we need to know what we're running. Um, OK, so uh, let's see. We'll, we'll cover the attack bit uh, in a, at, at the end, because I'm running a little short on time. Uh, I will say that this is a really important problem. This is the, uh, the Equifax vulnerability. This is the attack on the library. And you can see there's an expression language injection attack in this request. This is a, one that we actually blocked. And uh, this is super easy to exploit because it's a one, sh one HTTP request completely takes over your app server. And it's nothing to do with your code. It's completely inside the library. Um, so it's really important. You need to be able to respond to new vulnerabilities within hours. Uh, that's how fast the attacks start happening against new vulnerabilities that get released. And so I want you to consider, if your current approach is to scan, then when a new vulnerability comes out, you've got to go scan everything for where you're using that library. You've got to figure out if you're using it. You've got to rewrite the app. You've got to get the new, app, the new library. Then you've got to rewrite the app to be compatible with that new library. Then you've got to retest it and redeploy it. That's really expensive. And so I, I believe you have to have better infrastructure in place to respond within hours. I, I don't see any other alternative than RASP here to get in front of this attack and protect applications from being exploited. Um, OK, so that's it. We, we assess all the open source with IAST, and then we uh, protect it with RASP. Um, so let's move to the CICD environment. Uh, here, the goals. In CICD, you want security testing to be continuous, every build to be secured. And the problem with some of the legacy tools is they just take too long. They can take hours or days to run. Uh, and so it's very difficult uh, to do this without disrupting the, the process. Uh, and then you want it to be really integrated into that process. So you know, when, when you discover something, you want it to be integrated into Jenkins so that you can fail the build. You want to be integrated into the bug tracker, like Jira or, or uh, uh, Serena or something, so that you can uh, track that item and get it fixed. So you really need a full REST API here so that you can integrate it with your stuff and a bunch of plugins and so on. And then uh, really, I think it's important to be able to manage security policy across all of your applications. So you know, it'd be nice if I could say, hey, we're going we're gonna to move from triple DES to AES. I had a customer who tried this, by the way. They said, oh, we're going to get rid of triple DES. We don't think that's the future. We're going to move to AES. So they turned on that rule. and. They had thousands of places where they were using triple DES. You don't realize where MD5 and triple DES are in forever <laughs> in, in our world. So uh, they backed off that. They said, yeah, you know what, Tri triple DES is probably fine for another little while. <laughs> but 
uh, it's, it's useful to be able to do that kind of experiment in real time. You know, imagine if you tried to enable that rule with a static tool. You'd have to go rescan every single application. Uh, it, would take for, it would take years. Um, so this is the kind of, of experiment that we need. So um, here, I'll, I'll look at my CI/CD environment here. Uh, again, this works the same way. I'll run, I can run my test cases uh, here from, I can either run them from you know, my uh, development environment uh, or I can go into my CICD envi CI environment and uh, I'll uh, schedule, oh, I just scheduled two builds, that's awesome. So those are gonna run in the background, they're gonna start doing security testing. Uh, I might be logged out, maybe that's what's going on here. Um, so those builds are gonna run and they're gonna generate lots of uh, security findings. Uh, I have it set up so that those findings, when they come in, they go directly into my JIRA. And again, this is a difference between security in development and security in CICD. In development, you want instant feedback to developers so that they can fix it in stride. Uh, that cuts the cost of those vulnerabilities to almost zero. But if somehow those vulnerabilities sneak through that process and somebody checks in vulnerable code and it gets into, into CICD, then I think you want a little more formal process. You want to you know, create a ticket, get it tracked, get it fixed. And uh, so I like, I like automatically doing this uh, this plugin is a two-way integration, so that uh, when you close the JIRA ticket, it closes it in the IAS tool as well. So you can see I'm getting a bunch of new vulnerabilities as the test cases run uh, in the background here. That's a little annoying. Um, uh, so another thing that I think is important is getting code coverage metrics, like if you're using IAS, do you wanna make sure that you actually tested your application? So Normal security tools don't really tell you how much of the app they cover. Now, DAS tools, they, they don't do a great job of covering a lot of code. I encourage you to measure. Uh, you know, hook up a code coverage tool while you're running your DAS tool just to see. Uh, static tools, interestingly, also don't do a great job of covering all your code. It sounds like they would, right? They look, should look at every line of code, but that's not really how they work. Static tools build a model of your application, and then they follow a bunch of paths through it, but they're not very good at it. So they miss a lot of things. For instance, any path that goes through a library or a framework, they miss because they don't analyze all that code, it's too big. So this is an important way to understand what is actually being security tested. Uh, this is from a tool called Jococo, and uh, I actually, I put it in my palm, I don't know if you saw that when I was uh, setting this up, but you can see it's just another Java agent. You can run it right alongside IAS. Uh, just add the Jococo agent to the, the jar. Um, and then I get a nice report of, of coverage in this application, so I can uh, you know, pull up these numbers. You can even drill down into these different classes, and you can see uh, exactly what lines of code were tested. These are all lines of code that actually ran, and then you can see I probably need to do some work on my test suite for uh, get visits and set visits, right, to get full coverage over those. Okay, um, let's see, do I have anything else here? Uh, no, I think that's it. So at this point, we're making some good progress. I'm gonna show the, uh, the IS tool dashboard here, and I'm gonna zoom in on uh, uh, the Pet Clinic app. And what you'll see is uh, we're making some good progress here. We've now got a pipeline that automatically finds vulnerabilities in development. We're also seeing, uh-oh, <laughs> some of those are sneaking through into QA, so this is a sign of a very unhealthy project. You'd like to see this, this is good. Find vulnerabilities here and fix them, great. But if they're sneaking into here, you got a process problem. So you need to figure out what's going on. You know, why are people checking in code with vulnerabilities? And then what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move to production. So uh, let me just make sure there's nothing else I wanted to say here. Uh, so I asked, I asked works with all kinds of testing, uh, whether it's manual testing or automated testing or even real user testing, I asked is there watching and finding vulnerabilities. So I think we've achieved these goals. It's continuous, runs all the time in the background, you don't have to do anything. Anyone can use I asked to find vulnerabilities and fix them. It's integrated into your environments really nicely and uh, you get this ability to control policy, you get this instant uh, feedback on what's going on. All right, so this is a little rushed, there's a lot. Last step, production, we need to understand what's going on in production. So here are my goals. 
for what happens in, in operations. We need visibility. We need to know who's attacking us, what techniques they're using, and what they are targeting, what apps and APIs they're targeting with their attacks. That's just the visibility piece. That's great for threat intel. This will really help you focus your program on what matters. We also need to protect those applications. Like it's, if we observe them, we might as well stop them from working, right? So uh, we gotta be accurate here, right? So we can't overblock or underblock, uh, and we don't wanna spend a lot of time configuring stuff. And then on the control dimension, again, we wanna make sure that this protection keeps up to date, right? Some of these things are time critical. If a new CVE comes out, we wanna push that protection out everywhere so that we're protected. Uh, so let's look, at, uh, let's look at how that goes. Uh, uh, yeah, so RASP protects from within. I wanted to show one thing about uh, why RASP is a little different. So this is an untrusted deserialization attack, and you can see a serialized object in this payload. What happens here is the attacker creates a malicious object that and it contains objects that uh, the application wasn't expecting. And it just turns out that when you, uh, when you deserialize these objects, they cause code to run. Because when you deserialize an object, you have to run the constructor for those objects. And so if you craft this up just right, you can get that code to run here. And in this case, it's running a runtime.exec and launching the calc program. That's a complete host takeover with one simple request, right? So this is the kind of attack that WAFs can't see and will never see because all they see is a serialized object. You're not gonna deserialize the object in the WAF and check it to see if it's okay or not. Uh, it's no one, you know, it's, you'd have to do everything. <laughs> so this is really important. And uh, RASP can do this because RASP is inside the running application. It can essentially sandbox the deserialization process and prevent bad things from happening. So that's why it's quite different than, uh, than WAFs. And just before we get to it, everyone always asks this, RASP is really fast. Uh, much faster than a WAF or even than SSL. Uh, here you see SSL typically takes about five milliseconds. Uh, our implementation adds about 50 microseconds to a round trip request, but you should measure. Whatever RASP you decide to use, measure it carefully so you know if it's got a performance impact. But it's, it's super fast because it's running as part of the code itself, essentially. Okay, so let's take a look here. There's development, CICD, go into production here. And so this is my app. It's running in, uh, in my prod environment. And you know, all I have to do is, is try to attack this. Oh, I should, I should first demonstrate like, what this looks like in, in dev. If I go to my, uh, my browser here, I, you can see this is vulnerable to HQL injection if I actually try to exploit it. I pull all the data out of the database, right? Uh, so clearly exploitable. Uh, in production, though, I've got RASP enabled. And so when I try to do that same attack, I'll just do, I'll do Davis here. You can see this is you know, just pulling up the right information. But when I try to run this uh, attack, now RASP intervenes. It prevented that SQL attack from making it to the database. And really what RASP does inside is it's, it's going right to the line of code that's sending that query to the database, and it's throwing an exception. Basically, it's, it's essentially pretending that the database doesn't work right now. Like it's just throwing an exception like the database is down. That way the application can close this transaction and clean up anything so you don't leave anything in an inconsistent state. You maintain database integrity and you've got your application protected. So you can see I just got an alert that says, hey, uh-oh, we're under attack. And you can go check the dashboard here uh, to see what attacks look like uh, against your application. Again, this will always be up to date. But here we've got a bunch of uh, attacks, and I'll, I'll open this up to uh, everything so you can see all the different attacks. You can see, here's the SQL injection attack that we just did. Here's the attack value. Uh, here's a, you know, expression language injection, and some CVEs get attacked here. You know, lots of different things going on here. But this is critical information. You should know who's attacking you and what techniques they're using. I don't see how you can defend your app if you don't know what's going on. And what's cool about RASP is that you get all the details. So if I open this up, you can see, hey, this is the, uh, you know, the full HTTP request. You can see right down into the SQL query. You can even see the exact line of code that this, uh, this attack targeted. So again, it's a lot different than a WAF. Uh, a WAF could never tell you all this stuff. It could never tell you the currently logged in user. 
so just a, a lot of benefits here from an attack perspective. Okay. Uh, am I doing on time, Matt? Almost up? I'm sorry? Okay, gotcha. I'll, I'll just uh, wrap it up then. We're, we're right there. Okay, so look, uh, that's the pipeline that we built today. Anyone can do this. Uh, I'll just say if you want to scale your program, then you want something that can really run in parallel, and that's what IASP and RASP, IASP and RASP can give you. And I uh, just want to let you guys know, so this is just available, so it's early access. You guys can grab Contrast Community Edition and give it a try. Uh, just visit this URL, sign up, download the jar, and, and get going. It's currently, it's just Java, but we will, as soon as we can, we will make uh, .NET, Ruby, Python, and Node available as well. So uh, we're, we're pushing hard to do this. I really feel good about this. I, this is, I, I, it's actually a little bit hard to talk your venture investors into allowing you to do something like this. But for me, this is a path to giving great security tools to all the developers in the world that will never be able to afford you know, the, the Fortifies and Veracodes and, and tools out there. Any small team in the world can use this to write great secure code themselves. So uh, that's it. I'm sorry I'm out of time. I'm, I'm happy to take a few questions if I can, or else uh, you know, please stick around after. <laughs> thanks. We got, got a question right here. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Good talk. Um, so how do you know that in a specific data flow something is not being escaped? How, how yeah. do you conclude that? Yeah. So uh, I asked typically knows about all the standard encoders. Uh, the way that we do it, we actually have some AI built in that automatically identifies methods that look like escape methods but and you have validators. To, you have to recognize the methods. If, if, if I write a, a custom way of escaping, escaping... Yeah, Contrast uh, will automatically identify it, very likely, and add it to our list of known escapers. And we'll point it out to you in the trace, and then you can approve it as an uh, approved escaper if you want to. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's a very complicated uh, problem, but it's, uh, we've, we've put a lot of work into solving that, yeah. Thank you, Jeff. So you've shown the picture of uh, Jack Oko, unit test and integrator and test uh, combined in the Sonar Cube interface, right? Like showing us a coverage. Does IAS tool provide any kind of coverage metrics to say that uh, IAS tool covered this much part of the code for the security and these rules were applied? Like yeah. the C, yeah. Yeah, so uh, right now, you, you can rely on a standard code coverage tool like Jococo or ECLM or something. Um, but uh, that's something that we are adding to the product so you'll know exactly what was tested. Uh, that's probably not something that you're ever going to get from your static tool vendor. You'll never know what it actually looked at and what it didn't. I prefer to know. All right, let's give it up for Jeff. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs>